Hello and welcome to the Car Care channel and welcome to a very interesting video. So what is Toyota's best engine? An engine that is so good, nobody's been inside of it. Very few people have actually been inside of it. That engine would be the four-cylinder 2TR FE, the one that came in the Tacomas in the previous generation and even in the current generation. But today we have a sick one. This is a 2012 Toyota Tacoma with a 2TR FE, and you're about to watch us pull this car in the lift, pull this engine out, and investigate a very concerning problem, oil burning. Folks, full disclaimer, this is the first time I ever take one of these engines apart because they are that good. I have been inside every single Toyota engine from the late 90s all the way to today. Never this one, it is that good. But we have problems. We're going to investigate them in this video and more right after this. Let's grab some popcorn and maybe even dinner because this is the longest video I've ever made to date. Now, this 2012 Toyota Tacoma with the 2TR FE has 175,000 miles. The customer brought us the car and his main concern was this car burns two quarts of oil every thousand miles and it also loses coolant. Now initially when the customer brought me the car, I was puzzled. This engine is not known to burn oil. And as soon as I saw the, tow the snow plow connection in the front, I was concerned. But then again, I don't think you could do a lot of plowing with this truck. So did the standard tests, you know, pull the spark plugs, look at the cylinder. I saw a lot of debris. And then I saw some mysterious things with cylinder number one. We're going to look at it later when we take the engine apart and look at it. But I initially quoted them a short block because I see cylinder wear on the cylinder, especially cylinder number one. Other ones had a little bit of wear, but cylinder number one was really bad. Now, this engine ran fine, made a lot of noise, you know, dry belt noise, some idlers making noise and whatnot. That was hardly an issue. But then quoting the time for this job when you open the service manual and you'll notice we're working underneath it we're, we're pretty soon we're going to start removing the drive shafts and whatnot now their service manual the first thing the first page tells you to remove transmission and this was one of those moments where okay what do i do here should i try to get this engine out without removing the transmission you know i can suspend the transmission up and try to just remove the engine alone and then i remembered something that i learned a very 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 long time ago when i first started working on cars the first time you do a job for the for very first time follow the book to the t because you don't know what's what and there's a point you where you might actually be stuck so since this is the first time I'm doing this engine, removing this engine out of this car and tearing it apart, we followed the book to the T. First step, remove the transmission. Now, as we start removing the transmission, I notice, and you notice here I'm fighting the drive shaft nuts. That's because somebody severely over tightened them. I mean, these things were extremely over tightened. I mean, I'm fighting them here. And that was the first sign of somebody doing work to this that was perhaps not very informed of torque specs and all that. And that's fine. But then we had, to date, this is probably the most difficult job we've done. Probably the biggest undertaking, is especially filming it, was a lot of difficult folks. You know, you watch YouTube videos, you watch mechanics work. Filming, 
and working at the same time and then giving a car back to a customer that's going to potentially drive it for hundreds of thousands of miles are one of the most difficult things. And my hat goes out to everybody that films car repair, real car repair, not restoring my own car or whatnot where you take your time and everything takes a week or two. But working on customer cars and filming is very difficult. So this was possibly one of the most stressful videos I've made, I have to admit, because everything was new, not like other engines we've done on the channel where I've done hundreds of them and I know exactly what could go south and we're more comfortable, but this was an undertaking. Now I have to say one thing, this job is absolutely not a DIY job. It, this engine, when you look at it under the hood, it looks pretty simple. It's like, oh wow, this is small, tiny little four cylinder, not a big deal. I've removed a V6 out of this Tacoma and I will say it was easier than this. The V6, even though it's bigger, it just, the way it is mounted to the truck and the way everything is, it was easier. And this truck, when you look at the frame, I mean, through the shot, throughout the shots in the frame, frame is not rusty. It's actually decent shape. But as you start tearing into it, I mean, this thing was so rusty. Every single bolt gave us a fight. Every little thing gave us a fight. And then everything is so corroded and just, this was not fun, I have to admit. But we don't pick the jobs. The jobs that need to be done, get done. And that's how the automotive repair world works. Here we are pulling the transmission. Transmission was not too hard to remove, but we had a lot I mean, and I mean a lot of complications removing this transmission. Most of it I did not film because I needed to focus on making sure this car was good. But this may, video makes it seem like it's easy. It was not. And pretty soon, in a little bit, we're going to start talking about some of these things that happened. This was a massive undertaking, and it has to be said. Moving transmission is not hard normally, but the complications we had made it very difficult. There was a point where... We were getting a little desperate here where, okay, a lot of decisions had to be made in the moment. We did it. We got the transmission out. Transmission is about to come out. Let's talk about the complications that we had with this job so far, and we're not even close to removing the engine yet. So we got the transmission out. And as we talked about, this was actually a necessary thing. And it was a call that I had to make. I'm glad I made the long, easy route because we ran into so many problems. You didn't notice them in the time lapse, but let me share them with you. So when we went to get the transmission out, you had to remove all the bell housing bolts and two of them decided they were not ready to come out. This one and this one. Now, this looks like not a big deal, you know, well, Clean them up, drill them out, but how do you exactly drill this out in the car when you have really no space, especially this one? So I had to make a call. These are the kind of calls you make when you work on cars that you get into these situations. You have to get the transmission out. There's no other way around it. Even if you're not getting transmission out, you have to pull the engine away from it. And what happened is this was seized to the engine and this was seized to the engine. So there was no getting it out. So I went to look for price prices. We had to sacrifice something, basically, to cut these bolts and get the transmission out. We had to sacrifice something, the bell housing or the engine upper oil pan. Bell housing is a lot more expensive than the upper engine oil pan, so we had to sacrifice the upper engine oil pan. Let's go take a look. So when you look at it from here, yeah, this is banged up a little bit, but when you actually go look on the other side, I had to literally cut it completely off. See it right there? It's completely cut to pieces. And that's, that's the sacrifice I had to make. So we ran into a few more things here. One of them is the, tr the exhaust. So normally, you'd want to remove this exhaust. So it's out of your way when you pull the trans. But somebody decided to weld the connection point. So now you basically have to remove the entire exhaust out of the car. Now we got around it, we pushed it a little bit as we pulled the trans, we were, able, we were okay. So this is the back of the 2TR FE. Nothing really about it, but you do notice one thing, and I wanted to show it to you. Notice how rusty that block is, because this is cast iron, folks. 
This engine is going to be extremely heavy for a four-cylinder. Otherwise, it is pretty wide open. We don't have a lot going on. I mean, it looks like we haven't done much. This is basically the end of day one on this job. We didn't work on it the whole day, but it is the end of day one. We started at midday. We did get a lot of complications. I was cutting on this carefully not to damage anything. It went, it went okay, but it was already going south. Tomorrow, we're going to pick up the action again, and we'll pull the engine, which is now super simple to pull out because you have nothing to line up to. Just basically unhook everything and just pull it straight out. Should be simple, hopefully, if nothing else breaks. We did have one more casualty, and this is just the name of the game. The transmission dipstick, as soon as I touched it, it just broke. So that was something that was already going. You notice how it broke right here and it's connected here. Now Toyota loves to do this design where the bottom part of the dipstick is part of the oil pan. You see that it's a part of it right here. So hopefully, hopefully we can get this piece out. You see how rusty it is. We'll spend some time with it and we also have to drill the, this bolt. This one, I feel like we might be able to get it. You can't really get this in the car, but this is the transmission of a Tacoma four-cylinder, in case you haven't seen it. There is the uh, transmission vent, which is clear and open. We removed it with the transfer case. We did not drain the fluid. This was also a call. I don't want to get the fluid out of a high mileage transmission all out. We potentially could have issues because the service on this was a question mark. Folks, it is the end of the day for us here. We're going to wrap up the day. For you, it's going to be a few seconds. For us, it's going to be a night's sleep. And we'll come back first thing in the morning. We'll put you back on the time lapse. We'll get the engine out. We'll get everything going. And when the engine is out of the car, we'll talk about it. Well, this was not the proudest moment of this video. I mean, it took us a really long time to push this truck and get it orientated in the right way. Simply because the plan was we were booking two full days for this job. I mean, in two days, I figured we'd be able to get it done. Maybe the third day, we just drive the car, check it out, bleed it, whatnot, make sure we fix any after stuff that needs to be taken care of and we're done. Well, this job took a week and that was not the plan because we have other appointments and we're fully booked for a month out. So this really created a little bit of a havoc in the shop. But initially I started in the drive-on lift and Ironically, the car we just pulled up in the drive-on lift, that was supposed to be the car that pulls in the lift where the Tacoma is right now. But we started in the drive-on lift. I've, I've removed transmissions there on like rear-wheel drive configuration, trucks and cars. It's much easier there because you have a lot of space and the car is stable. You don't have to worry about it. We only have two lifts and the third drive-on, actually a fourth one is on the works. But this was the mid of day two. And that was the point where I'm realizing this project is really going to push us back. But it has to be done. There is no way around it. We have to get this done. And the problem is the parts list continued to grow rapidly. And here's where I had to deviate from the book. I tried to remove the exhaust here, the exhaust manifold. I mean, none of the nuts were even moving. Everything was rounding off. I don't even have space to put a turbo socket or something to get them out. And these are the calls you have to make in the moment. Then I realized, you know what? I think the exhaust manifold can stay. And then I moved to the compressor. The compressor gave us really a hard time. Some of the bolts broke and we'll, we'll show you that as we go. Things were very interesting with this because the truck didn't seem rusty, but once we start taking things apart, I mean, everything, there was things going left and right. Basically this customer, forgive me if you watch this, as the engine comes out, let me tell you this real quick. And literally every five minutes I run to the computer to order a part, look up a part, order it because this bolt broke that bracket, broke this. It just, the list kept growing and growing and growing. And later when we talk about the cost of this job, I'll share it with you. This was a very happy moment for me when the engine was coming out right up to this very moment where we had to stop because the engine didn't want to come out, didn't clear, and the jack was maxed out. This was very fun. And I say it was difficult, but actually this, is, this was a good challenge. I love me a good challenge, and this keeps you as a mechanic kind of focused, challenged, and on your toes. And that's every mechanic knows this moment, and it's a very happy moment, at least for me. Keeps you motivated and going. 
All right, so we have the engine out. And folks, I have to say, this was not fun. I mean, things were rusty and we had a lot of issues. You already seen the issues with the transmission. This was a lot. We had a lot of issues here. First thing, the motor mount bolts. We really had a problem with these. They were really hard to come off. They were rusty, spinning, and all kinds of problems. But there's something I want you to see about this engine. If you look right in this area, look how crusty that is. And that is because this is a cast iron block. I mean, look at this, all the flakes falling off. This is a cast iron block, it's not aluminum. And then the AC compressor. So I decided, while we were kind of trying to get this out, I've decided to leave the compressor in the car and instead take the AC down, you know, the charge out and put everything together. The reason for that is one of the lines blocked one of the bolts. So we were basically going to have to hand wrench this bolt. And I'm like, you know what? Let's just take the AC out. Let's pull the whole compressor. It'll make our life so much easier. And actually, the lines moved out of our way and life is good. Now, if we look at the front here, there's a few things that we are replacing. This one, customer already replaced. We are replacing the water pump. We are replacing this tensioner because it has a lot of play and makes noise. But I just noticed that this idler, let's hear it. That makes a lot of noise there. So we're gonna end up replacing this AC compressor. Nice and quiet. I don't hear anything there. This engine is very interesting to remove. It's extremely heavy and I can tell. Folks, I've removed so many engines in my life. In my opinion, this is actually heavier than a V6 because of the iron block. And going around this way, I left the exhaust manifold on. I'm saying this in case you're removing one of these. I left the exhaust manifold on because it was really not in the way. I just removed the shield. I actually started removing the secondary air injection out. But then I noticed that there is enough room to pull it out. But we had one last problem with this, which was removing the actual engine from the car. So we got the jack, the hoist, all the way as high as it goes. It was not clearing. You notice in the time lapse, I had to lift the car up a little bit with the engine suspended, take the wheels off, and drop the front so we can actually clear. We got it. It's out. Hopefully, and I don't want to jinx myself here, this is the easy part now. I'm tearing this engine apart and seeing what's going on now that we're not working with the confines of the car. Let's do this. Let's put you on a time lapse. Let's tear this engine completely apart. And we're gonna find out why this engine is burning oil and what are we gonna to do to fix it. So this right here, this very moment, was the happiest moment for me. This was a new experience, tearing into this engine. And apart from the very, very rusty exhaust manifold bolts, everything else was just a joyous moment. Look, I love engine work. Obviously, if you've watched my channel, you know that I love engine work and I'm very fascinated by engines and everything. So this was a joyous moment because there has been absolutely no information. If you're a Toyota technician, I don't know if you want to watch work at home, but if you are a Toyota technician, you've taken one of these engines apart, do share your experience because I've I've worked at Toyota for a very long time. I've never taken one of these apart, and I've never seen anybody else take one of these apart. Every single other engine we've done, not this one. My joyous moment was figuring out how the wiring harness is, and, and the best way for me to describe this engine, and I'm gonna start from a very broad description, and as we go with the video, I'll kinda narrow it down and give you my opinion. So this engine, the best way to describe it is, it is, a very large combination of old school and new stuff, actually. This will surprise you. So the cylinder head is a one-piece cylinder head. But the very interesting thing is it doesn't have buckets. I was expecting going into this to have buckets. Of course, I looked at the manual and everything, and we I knew what we were doing. But I expected to see buckets because this is an old school engine. This is a very, very old school engine. But no, we actually had hydraulic lifters and kind of a modern engine valve train with an old school cylinder head and and the injectors were very interesting the way they sit in the cylinder head they had like this big sleeve it was very very strange the valve cover i have never taken a valve cover on a toyota that has this many bolts and it was this difficult and scary to remove it's a little bit on the flimsy side it's a plastic one the gasket is weird like it had multi, a multi-piece gasket. 
not something common with Toyota. And then that little, I just removed it, that little oil jet on top, that is something unique. I've never seen it in any other Toyota engine. And then just the little details. The front timing cover was possibly the most interesting. And this took me a minute to figure out because it has so many bolts and it has bolts from the back and it's just interest. Now, of course, we're removing the oil pan right here. All the bolts got replaced. They're all stripped, every single one of them. And then here's where things are a little interesting. Every bolt that normally is a 10 millimeter bolt head is a 12. And that's the weird part. Now, this sub pan, it broke. So we're, we had to cut it, as I showed you. We had to replace it. But the front cover has a lot of bolts. And it was super confusing because there are bolts hidden in the back. There are bolts everywhere. There's so many bolts holding this little cover that all it does is just has the oil pump in it. I don't know why. Chain design is super simple, actually extremely simple. And another new school touch is the chain tensioner is internal. That was another thing. And then well, I'll show you this in a little bit. The balance shaft actually is super complicated. It looks like of a German car. I mean, it's, what I call it is a contraption. It has chain and guides and all these gears and all kinds of complications for the balance shafts. And you'll see that in a little bit when we talk about it. But this is, here we're taking, you know, I'm putting the rockers and the hydraulic lifters. and the, That looks like exactly out of a 2G RFE, for example. But then the cylinder has one piece. So if you look at a 1GR of that same generation Tacoma, that has buckets. This has hydraulic lifters. That just tells you how good this engine is. Hydraulic lifters are always better. There's no adjustment. Everything is very simple. The head bolts were 14 millimeter, 12 point socket. That was a pretty interesting design. Let's look at the engine. We'll continue our conversation. So we have the engine all apart and we kind of started our investigation. There's something I'm seeing that I don't like, but before we get to that, would you look at this cast iron block and you just look at the state that it is in. If we look here, look at this rust, it's coming off. And my favorite part is this one. And this thing is just disintegrating, basically. I think uh, if you leave this here for a few more years, you'll start having holes. But there's something interesting about an iron block. There's too many freeze plugs. I mean, there's four here, there's four over there, there's three in the back. There's just too much freeze plug going on. This engine is very interesting. If we look at the front here, where I call it the contraption of the balance shaft. So this engine has two balance shafts run by a chain. And then this whole thing, actually, I was, I was about ready to start disassembling it, but then we looked at the new engine, it actually comes with it. Even with the new tensioner, new guide, new everything, all this comes with the new engine, which is pretty interesting. But then we look here at some of these uh, things. I thought there was no way we can get the block drain out, but actually I was able to turn this. Same thing with this is actually loose. Now the oil pressure switch, that's not gonna happen. Look how rusty this thing is. It's insane how rusty this thing is. So uh, we're just gonna replace that oil pressure switch because I don't even trust it. But here's what we have. Here's what I don't like about this engine right now. If you look at the cylinders right here, one of them is clean and the rest of them are carboned up. Middle ones are the same. It's just one cylinder that is clean. Usually when you see a cylinder like this, it's been coolant washed, basically like vapor blasted, if you would. And then we look at the cylinder head, which is sitting right here. We did some cleaning to it. You notice these three cylinders have carbon. This one is almost new. I mean, this is, this is like been vapor washed. So here's what I'm worried about. Do we have a head gasket problem? First thing is, I don't care about the block because we're replacing that. And that's what we're gonna end up he doing here. And I'll show you the wear marks on the one cylinder pretty soon. But I'm worried about this here, because this we are gonna reuse. We will service, check the valves, lap them, do all the good stuff, replace the seals, check everything. But I cleaned this a little bit because you don't wanna leave remnants of the old gasket. 
This is a straight edge. This is how you check warpage on cylinder heads. So per the book, the first position is here. This is a 2000s feeler gauge. That is the maximum allowed warpage. And this is not going in. This is not going in. The cylinder has not warped this way. Now we're going to go this way and check it again. This is good. This is good. This is good. Now we're going to go across this way. This is good. This is good. Good. And good. Just to take it to the next level, I'm going to put it offset. We'll also check it. This is good, good, good. This is also good. It was going here because we have the colon passage. Then I'm going to check it right here. This one is good, good, and good. I think the cylinder head is not warped. I mean, this car ran perfectly fine. It just burned a lot of oil. So. Here is what we have. I think what happened here is the cylinder head gasket blew right in this area. It was leaking coolant into the cylinder. Not a large amount where it would cause issues, but if you look at the appearance of the water jacket covers, they all look fine except here. It just looks off. And I, I just don't like the shape of this. It looks like something was leaking through here. So potentially that's what it is, because I was worried when I saw that cylinder the way it is, that we have potentially a head gasket issue that caused this whole problem. But here's what actually caused the oil consumption. Let's spin this engine. And this is going to be really hard to show on camera, but we'll try our best. If you look in the cylinder, this looking this way, you can actually see cylinder wall wear right here. It's really hard to show. I'm going to try to show you guys. You have cylinder wear right there. I hope you can see it. And then when we turn around and look at the other side, there you can see it very clearly. I mean, we have a very large area that the cylinder is really worn down in the middle right there. So this is, this is what we have. Now this other cylinder doesn't look too bad and the other two also do not look too bad. They, we do have these typical marks at the very top, but they're not too bad. And that's, that's where we're at. So what we're going to do here is put a short block. I think it's more cost effective and it is better because I'm really worried about the condition of this block, how rusty it is. So here is the new short block. It is super pretty, has to be said. Very heavy, extremely heavy. And this was the struggle of us dealing with it. But would you look at this? beauty right here. This is a brand new 2TR short block. And if you look at this section right here, you notice it has all the balance shaft and everything attached to it, even a new chain, new tensioner, new everything. Pretty interesting, but it doesn't have anything else. It doesn't have the block drain, doesn't have the pressure sensor, of course, so we had to order that. This project is really for lack of a better word, it has to be said the truth. It's going south because not only did this stuff, we have to order them and they're not readily available. I mean, I've in my entire career with Toyota, I've never taken one of these engines apart. They're that good. This one, however, did have some cylinder wear. And I'll tell you why in a second, why I think that is. But uh, we do also have to get a new dipstick because the dipstick just flat broke out. That's not going to happen. So we're getting a new dipstick tube. And the reason this truck burns oil, in my opinion, I'm going to say one thing. And if the owner of this truck is watching, don't take offense to this. But the truth has to be said, and you secretly know it. 
This is a four-cylinder, four-wheel drive Tacoma. Really a trim that, in my opinion, shouldn't exist because you can't really do any off-roading with this. It's just too underpowered. This is a workhorse. This would be two-wheel drive, and you see commercial accounts using these all day long. But would you look what we have underneath it? For our friends in the southern states or in areas where you don't have snow, that looks like just a very fancy tow hitch in the front. It doesn't make sense. For our friends in the salt belt, this is a snow plow connection. Usually, if you snow plow with a Tundra that has a lot more power, it's a lot bigger, it's not sufficient. You need a heavy duty truck. You need something heavy and heavy duty to really plow with, let alone a four cylinder Tacoma. I mean, this thing did not have an easy life. I don't think they really snow plowed big field, big like parking lots or whatever. Maybe a small thing, maybe driveways or whatever. But still, this is simply too much. You are pushing this engine, you're pushing this transmission to the limit, especially the transmission, but the engine took the brunt of the beating and that's why we're burning oil. It's just, it's overloaded, let's put it this way. Because I don't think you will find another 2TR that burns oil unless it was pushed to the limit or just severely poorly maintained. This is one of the best Toyota engines, hence the reason why a, a Toyota engine specialist has never opened one. I have been inside every single Toyota engine in the modern times. Let's say starting from late 90s all the way to today, even the modern stuff. I've never opened one of these engines. This is the very first one. And possibly why things are going south because there's no experience. There's no reference. We're not, oh, I know this bolt is common to break because it's broke 10 times. We were going to the unknown, but we got it done. We're now going to start assembly, which we're going to put you guys back on the time lapse. Maybe we'll talk about some cost of this job and we'll assemble the engine fully, which we're still waiting for a lot of parts. This is really pushing us back, but what are you going to do? We'll put it all together and then we'll, we'll give it to you guys to the grand finale when the car is actually ready to start. Before we start talking about the costs of this job, I just want to clarify one thing. Look, this was a long project and I was really focused on it. Maybe in the video I was not clear. Let's just clarify the actual cause of this failure in case you own one of these engines and you kind of feel disappointed that we had this issue. Look, I think this is my final assessment and this is what I actually conveyed to the customer why this happened. Because there was, look, looking from the outside, there's no way for me to know exactly why this engine burned oil and why. And you know if you've watched my channel, the why is very important, folks. Most people just, oh yeah, let's just throw an engine and hope for the best. The why is very important. I really need to see it. So here's the why in this car. I think this engine was pushed to its limit by the plowing. Now, what happened from that is we had a small cylinder head gasket leak. So coolant was making its way in the cylinder, cylinder one specifically. As time passed, that cylinder is consistently getting washed down, washed down. And look, every engine will have its characteristic of how it, it copes with harsh conditions like that. For example, 2011, 2010 Prius, you know, third generation Prius engine. I mean, very little coolant leak will cause it to run horrible. This engine, apparently, and just from driving it before we did this job, when you have a small head gasket leak, nothing will happen. It'll run perfectly fine. That's just how good this engine is and how well balanced it is. So this is basically the final assessment I think this engine failed and started burning oil and basically warranted this entire job, which was not simple, not cheap. You'll find that out. It's a head gasket leak that turned into this entire thing. Basically, the coolant was washing the cylinders all the time. And that's what caused the cylinder wear. And that's what started the oil consumption and everything is history. So if you own one of these engines, do please investigate very closely when you have mysterious coolant loss. Because after this engine was done, I actually addressed the, the kind of asked the customer, how much coolant was this losing? He's like, I have to top off the coolant every month. Otherwise, we run le really low and we lose heat and all that stuff. This is important, folks. When you see coolant loss, every month you're having to top off a lot. 
you need to investigate it. This is super important because if you don't have external leaks, there's only one other place that's going out the tailpipe. It's it's a head gasket leak. And should have this should have this have been addressed a long time ago when it first started? I don't think we would have gotten to this point. Remove the cylinder head out of this car in the car is not a massive undertaking. It's actually not difficult at all. But removing the whole engine is difficult. And speaking of the engine, let's talk about some of the costs associated with this job. Just for you to get reference. Now, everybody has their own choice. I don't think this truck was really in bad shape. Transmission, I have my question marks about it, but it's been serviced. This truck is really taken care of by the owner. He is a, somewhat of a DIY mechanic. He does some of the things himself, but he takes care of it. And that's it's his work truck. He knows he beats it, but he takes care of it at the same time. You can see oil change history is really good. The engine is actually pretty clean on the inside. And here are the costs. Labor is 24 hours. This was actually per the book. I've never done this job, so I can't really modify the labor up or down because I've never done one. So we go with the book and see what happens. Now, that equates to $2,880. The short block itself was $2,655 and some change. Expensive, but again, not common. This block actually took a while to arrive because it was it's not readily available because I don't think this is a very common job. Let's put it this way. Gasket kit was surprisingly on the low side of things. Usually they're 500 plus. This one was 372 and some change. Now we have sealer for $20. We have coolant for 54 bucks. Two oil changes. I normally charge two oil changes for an engine. We run an engine for a couple hours. Then we drain the oil, drain the filter. So there is... 10 bottles of 0W20, which actually it's less than what this engine needs for two oil changes, but we took care of that. Two oil filters, some cleaner. And then this is where things kind of went downhill. So here are the additional parts that we added after this job was, was all started, basically. Exception of the water pump. The water pump was 123 customer wanted to replace it, it's already coming out i think it's a good idea because two of the common problems with this engine is a valve cover gasket leak and the water pump leak so we addressed both i suppose then we put four new spark plugs i usually always put new spark plugs on an engine that burns oil they usually have carbon all kinds of stuff then the drive belt tensioner that was not really in good shape then the drive belt itself was kind of worn out basically from the tensioner not being well and then we put the idler the one drive belt idler that was making noise we replaced that and then the oil pressure switch then the upper oil pan then the ac compressor bolts and the exhaust manifold bolts and, and sorry nuts and then the odds and ends in between there's a giant list of things that got replaced little stuff nothing big brackets whatnot but that brought the grand total and this is you might want to be seated for this the grant brought the grand total to seven thousand three hundred and seventeen dollars now some people will jump out of their seat and say this is absolutely not worth it you know what this was this one was a hard call this was borderline and this customer initially right the car in i advised them you might want to think this one out because this truck has miles I'm worried about the transmission. Yes, the frame is very clean. Actually, it doesn't have rust. Usually, if you have a Tacoma, that's usually what kills a Tacoma. Otherwise, it'll just keep going forever. Especially this generation Tacoma. I mean, 2005 to 2015 Tacoma in my book was the best one. It was comfortable, it was spacious, and it had the best engines. This is one of them. But this was a tough call. And I, I kind of let the customer decide this one out. I told him, you know... This is a lot of money, and this truck hasn't had an easy life. Yes, you took care of it, but it hasn't had an easy life. So I am worried about the transmission, although it shifts perfectly fine. But still, knowing what kind of use they, they used it for, it is a concern of mine. So the customer actually initially said, you know what? I'm going to keep topping the oil. I'll keep, keep an eye on everything. I, I was worried about the coolant level loss, but... He said he will keep an eye on everything. He'll think about it and kind of price a new truck and see. But then, lo and behold, out of the blue, he just calls and says, 
I'm ready to do this. I want to do this. And the way we do this with customers at the shop, prices will fluctuate significantly for these parts. So what I usually do, at least for the big part, like short block, gasket kit, we take a deposit. We schedule the appointment. We usually schedule it very far. We usually book out a month or two out sometimes. So we'll schedule it. Customer will put a deposit. Deposit, you know, we can refund it minus the restocking fee for to ship the parts back. We get them straight from Toyota. We order the block. Actually, this block sat in our shop for a while, the new one, because you never know when they go on back order. You never know if the price all of a sudden jumps up. So I usually take the deposit, order the parts, have them sit nice and safe in the corner, waiting for the appointment. Life is good. Now, folks, I want to mention one thing, and this might have been the reason why this customer decided, you know what, let's fix this truck and keep it. The current situation of the car market buying-wise, buying cars, you know, a small story I'll share with you, and I hope this helps you. My neighbor, my dear neighbor, somebody that, they're just not just neighbors, we consider them as family. They have a Chevy Equinox, possibly the worst car on the planet. That's just my personal opinion, professional opinion. Anyways, they got done with that car. It's a 2013. It has more problems than any Toyota will have at any given time unless it's just pushed off a cliff. So I told them, you know what? It is time for you to move on from this because this is just never ending. Basically, I am working on this car, helping them out every three months. And now it needs a water pump, which equals you got to pull the front cover because the water pump is during my chain. Anyways, long story short, this car is done. It's worth nothing. It needs a ton of work. They will. They want to buy a car. I mean, I went with, with them to help them out, check some cars out. I don't... I was shocked by the state of the current used car market. And it really breaks my heart to know that folks are having to deal with this these days. And that's what's driving people to put all kinds of money in their older cars just to keep them so they wouldn't have to overpay for another car. Folks, be careful with that. Look, some people will say, oh, you own an automotive shop. Of course, you love it. You want people to keep their old cars and keep spending money on them. I actually don't because... You do the right thing, the right thing will come back to you. That's what I believe in, and that's what I base my life on. I want to put food on the table of my kids that I feel like I earned it working very hard and doing the right thing. So here's here's the thing with cars. If a car is worth fixing, it's worth fixing. If a car is not worth fixing, don't fix it. This is a very important thing. Don't make your should I fix your car should I fix my old car decision based on I can't get another one because of the market. No, make it based on is this car worth fixing or not. If you have Toyota or Lexus, look, there are other models, Honda, whatnot, there are good cars to keep, but I am a Toyota specialist. I'm gonna keep this conversation, Toyota or Lexus. Just because it's a Toyota or Lexus and they're good cars, and you can keep them forever or whatnot, doesn't mean you should always. Because at least in my area, cars rust out, things pile up. And usually cars that are taken care of, they'll not have major issues. Unless you really push them to the limit, like this Tacoma. Obviously, the owner knew that he was using it for perhaps not its intended purpose, perhaps pushed past the limit. That's why he did his math, did his... Whatever whatever thought he process he had that made him decide to do this. But I see customers all the time. And this is something that the shop kind of opened my eyes to. And I'm really, I love my shop. I love doing what I do every day. It made me see people from all walks of life, talk to them, help them with their cars and whatnot. And this is my important message to you. Don't decide big repairs in the moment and i see people do this they come in car burns oil they'll immediately say yeah 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 let's fix it six thousand dollars you you can't do that you got to think about it you got to do your math well how much is this car worth did you even consider that what is out there did you ask if you can get a new car did you run your numbers this is very important folks and we've talked about this in another video but i want to Slightly go over it again because this is very important. You got to do the right math. 
you got to first go. Don't just watch three YouTube videos that say, hey, the market is really bad for used cars right now. You don't want to buy a used car right now. That video might be old. That video might be outdated. Things are changing all the time. You go facts in the ground. You go walk in dealerships. You go ask. You go look. You go investigate yourself before you make any big decisions that potentially will strand you financially, hurt your family. Do the right thing. I see people all the time. They bring me an old car that is rusty. That's way too far gone. And they want to fix it and keep it on the road. I flat out said, you know what? I don't recommend you do this. And if it's not good for me, it's not good for you. You can take it somewhere else, have somebody mend it. I don't mend cars. I fix them for them to last a reasonable amount of time. And if any of you have been to my shop, have talked to me, the first thing I ask you with old cars is, what is the plan? You got to have a plan with older cars. The When the plan sounds like this, I want to keep my car forever, usually I have a problem with that. Nothing lasts forever. Humans don't last forever. That's just how life is. You got to have a plan with your old car. Okay, I'm fixing this car. It needs this laundry list of things. Of course, it's an older car with rust. I want to keep it for three more years. When you tell me that, I can, from my experience... And, and that's not just me, any mechanic, from their experience, from seeing your car, they'll be able to tell you, is this a realistic thing? Can you really get three more years out of this car reasonably? Or is this going to be kind of a money pit? And, and that's the important thing. Now, we can give you an, an, an educated estimate. Is this a realistic expectation or not? Because for you to keep putting money into cars, it just becomes counterproductive at some point. At some point, you're better off going, buying another car, overpaying for another car, than keep putting money in your old car that's not worth it. This is very, very important, folks. I see people fall into this mistake over and over and over. That was the, the time where I was at the dealership. I didn't have a say. You just hand me keys to a car and the job. Hey, get it done. I don't know who the customer is. And this is what I love about my shop. I can look at customers in the eye and tell them, this is not worth it. Here's your keys. Have a nice day. If you want to venture off in this adventure, I don't want to be with you because I don't think this is worth it. If I don't think a car is worth the repair, period, I won't do the job even if you want to do it because I hope that that kind of incentivizes the customer to really think about it twice and decide, you know what, this is not worth it. One story I'll tell you, we had a, a beautiful IS300. Now, I, I don't know if the customer is watching. Maybe he's, he, I know he's a viewer. If you're watching this, it was a blue IS300. It was one of the cleanest IS300s I've ever seen. But it was so rusty. Things were falling. There was holes in the, in the unibody and everything. I told him, this is not worth fixing. I'm not even going to charge you for an inspection move on from this car. And I'm so glad that he actually responded and said, you know what, I see your point. This is a very clean car, but it's not worth it. I'm moving on for this. I'm taking your advice because keeping a rusty car going is not a good idea. Just because the market is bad doesn't mean you should put all your money in your current car because sometimes that becomes counterproductive. Folks, this is a very happy moment for me as well. Car is about to start. Let's check out the first start of this new engine. All right, we have finally arrived at the moment where we start this engine. I have to be honest, this is multiple days later. We had to wait for a lot of parts. The engine dipstick, the transmission dipstick, a few other odds and ends that took a long time to get. This, these parts are not readily available because this engine Parts for it are not readily available because it's not a common engine to be taken out, replaced, or serviced, or whatever the case may be. So I have the crank position sensor disconnected. We're going to crank this engine, prime it, then we're going to give it the first start. Let's go do that.
And the oil light is off. That was a kind of a quick prime. Battery is an Optima battery, so it should be good. I'm gonna plug in my crank sensor. Now it should start. And I have to admit, I'm a little nervous about this one. She's alive. I see. Sounding pretty healthy. That wine is a secondary air injection. It's alive, ladies and gentlemen. There we go. There goes secondary air injection. Nice and quiet. Any leaks? I think we are good. Very happy. This sounds pretty healthy. Let's listen to it. There you have it, folks. That's one more engine done. This is the first two TRFE that I do. It was not easy. We had a lot of complications, but you know what? This is how this job is. You go through the motions. You kind of work on these cars, deal with, with problems as they come. But in the end, it's got to get done. It's got to get done right. And we arrived at this point. Now we are not even close to being done here because you notice the hood is off. We haven't charged AC yet. We still got to drive it, do another oil change in case any of the debris that we didn't catch cleaning. It get caught by the filter or it sits in the oil pan. We're gonna drain the oil again, change the filter again, and then we'll drive it some more and she should be ready, hopefully for more than 175,000 miles is what this truck has. If they remove this uh, snow plow hit or the connection point, I think this truck would last even a lot more because this engine is not known to have any issues, but this one, I think it was pushed past the limit. That's why we had these issues and that's why we were doing this rebuild. Folks, I hope this video is helpful and informative. I hope you learned something new. If you like it, consider giving it a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing to the channel. Check out some other videos. And until the next video, folks, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And you have yourself a wonderful day.